So today we're going to talk about storage proofs. I want to introduce this. Uh, ah. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm going to present you storage proofs and explain why they're cool, how to work with them, why you need tooling to work with them, and yeah, a bunch of other things. Why is it even possible? All the complexities behind it, the trade-offs, and so on. So. A few words about storage proofs. Why I really believe that they are cool, especially uh, nowadays. So my thesis is that Ethereum is pretty sharded nowadays. And with storage proofs, we can essentially read the state in a almost synchronous manner, which is a pretty, pretty nice thing to do, um, given the circumstances. Um, yeah, and maybe also let me explain why is it even possible. So storage proof is essentially this idea that the entire state is committed in a cryptographic manner um, using some data structure like Merkle trees, Merkle Patricia trees, and so on. Um, and yeah, we can essentially verify any specific piece of state at any point in time on any domain, which is pretty nice and doesn't introduce additional trust assumptions. You just rely on the security of like the base chain. Um, so yeah, that's like storage proofs TLDR, where they are cool. Now a bit of like sponsored section, uh, <laughs> sponsored section. So uh, what we're doing at Herodotus. So our like goal is to make smart contracts self-aware in a way uh, by providing access to historical state. Uh, we, like I said, my thesis is that Ethereum is pretty sharded nowadays. We want to unshard it by using storage proofs, and we want to enable synchronous data reads because today we do not have really nice ways to make synchronous data access without introducing new state, uh, new trust assumptions. So yeah, that's what we do. And how we achieve that? We achieve that by using obviously storage proofs. We use snarks, starks, and MPC. Uh, I will get why we even use all this tooling. But first, a few words about storage proofs, what these are, and, and so on. <laughs> it's so tricky, actually. I, I need to be multitasking. OK, so uh, what we're going to cover in today's workshop. So all the basics required to like understand properly this primitive, how to like work with it, uh, how you can generate these proofs, why they're pretty useful, and how actually you can access these commitments. I'll get later what we call a commitment uh, in a trustless manner, and how we make smart contracts self-aware and enable historical data reads. Cool. So. Um, it's pretty, uh, that's pretty tricky. So uh, about the background that I want you to have for this workshop. So we're gonna like start from the biggest basics. So what is a hashing function? Just a very quick reminder. I hope it will take less than a minute. Uh, like generalized blockchain anatomy, how an Ethereum header uh, looks like, why Ethereum are not like pretty on, only like Ethereum focused. Uh, however, I think that for the sake of this workshop, it's the best to like present on this concrete example. Miracle trees, explain me like on five. I will just quickly explain the idea, how it works, and what is a Miracle Patricia tree without really going too much into the details. Um, yeah, finally, no, not finally, uh, the anatomy of the Ethereum state. It's pretty important to like deal with this, uh, with this primitive, and finally, how to deal with the storage layout. Cool, so hashing function. Essentially, it's this idea. <laughs> Essentially, it's this idea that I can have a function that takes some input of any size and it always always return an output of a fixed size. And now, what's also important, there is no input. There are no two inputs that will generate the same output, and you cannot reverse uh, the hashing function. So it means that given the output, you don't know what is the input. And this is that what we call like collision resistance. Pretty useful primitive, like used in blockchains. Uh, I will, and I think that's, that's pretty much it. I assume that everyone is like familiar with it. Like, yeah. Okay. Why is it important? Um, so generalized blockchain anatomy. So why we call it a chain? Because we have a bunch of blocks bind together, like linked together. Because each block contains the reference to the parent hash, 
and the previous header contains the reference to the parent hash, which is pretty cool. And let me remind what the hash, the, the parent hash or the block hash of uh, on Ethereum is. It's essentially the hash of the header. Uh, pretty important to deal with these primitives and make smart contracts self aware so accessing six oracle state. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Let's get to the next part. So, um, no. Uh, I think I'm missing one slide. No, it's the correct one. Okay, so uh, this is an Ethereum block header. Uh, as I said, we're gonna go through the example of Ethereum concretely. So a bit of anatomy. So to access state, obviously we need the state root. What is the state root? Is the root of the Merkle Patricia tree of the Ethereum state. We also have the transactions root, which is pretty useful if you want to access historical transactions like their entire body um, and receipt root. So it's pretty useful to access any events, logs, and and so on. And all of these are like root of the Merkle Patricia tree. A Merkle Patricia tree is a Merkle tree. Just think of it in that in that way. And most importantly, we have the parent hash. And with the parent hash, we can in a way go go backwards. I think that's. It let's get to Merkle tree. So essentially, it's this idea that I can take whatever amount of data and I can commit it in a cryptographic manner by using this data structure. So on the left side, we see a standard Merkle tree. So essentially, all the data goes to the bottom, and we essentially hash it. You know what the hashing function is. Then we combine these two hashes together. We hash it, and the, we keep doing that till we get to essentially one hash, and this is what we call the root. Merkle Patricia tree, modified Merkle Patricia tree to be exact. This is uh, the data structure that we use in Ethereum. Um, what you see here, I hope you see, on the top we have the state root, and essentially the state root is the root of this tree. And now how it works and how you should think of this, of this, it's a pretty complex data structure. I don't want you to bother with it today, but essentially we have three types of like nodes. We have Leaf nodes, extension nodes, and branch nodes. So leaf nodes contain data, branch nodes contain data, and extension nodes, like on the high level, just help us to like sort of navigate in that tree. But to be honest, to deal with storage truths, you don't really need to understand this part, but to like build on the low level as we do, obviously we need to uh, we need to deal pretty uh, pretty a lot with that with that part. Okay. So Ethereum state, how is it constructed? Most important takeaway, it's a two-level structure. So I mentioned that the state root is a commitment of the entire state, but it's not really true because Ethereum is a... Does it still work? Okay, it works. It's, uh, it's account-based, um, and essentially the state root is the commitment of all the accounts that exist on Ethereum. And what an account is made of, it's made of a balance, like the if balance, it's a nonce, transaction counter, storage root. The storage root is like the root of another Merkle Patricia tree. And this Merkle Patricia tree contains a key value database that holds like the mapping from storage key to its actual value. And finally, we have the code hash. It's essentially the hash of the, of the bytecode. So main takeaway, first we access accounts. And once we have the account storage root, we can access its, its, its storage. Okay, um, cool. So to sum it up, uh, like the background, so main takeaways. Given the block state root, you can recreate any any state for this specific block on this network. And given an initial trusted block hash, you can essentially recreate all the previous headers, which is pretty pretty cool and important to get the ideas that I will explain like pretty soon. Okay. So as it's gonna be a workshop, it's a short one. So I won't let you code, but I will show you some concrete examples. So what I want you to like go through with me today is how we can prove the ownership of a Lens profile on another chain. So a bit of background. Lens profiles are represented as NFTs and Lens is deployed on Polygon. I think that's it. How do we get to this? So first of all, the question that we need to answer to ourselves is how does Polygon commit to Ethereum L1? Because if we want to, like, let's say, prove the ownership of a Lens profile on Optimus, we need to know the state root of Polygon. But there is Ethereum L1 in the middle, so 
how do we actually access this on HTML1 primarily? So uh, Polygon is a commitment commit commit chain, and it commits to to Ethereum uh, a bunch of things every some amount of time. And essentially, on L1, we do not validate the entire state transition, but we just verify the consensus of Polygon. And this checkpoints, how they call it, essentially contain uh, state routes and so on. I mean, not directly, but we can access them. And let's get to this to this part. So this is taken from Polygon's documentation. And this is how a checkpoint looks like. So as you can see, the checkpoint is made of a proposer. So who proposed the block? Start block, end block. Let, give me a second, I'll get to this. And most importantly, we have the root hash. So the root hash is essentially a Merkle tree, not a Merkle Patricia tree, that contains all the headers. And which headers? The headers in the range of start block and end block. Cool. So now, if we get back to the previous part, we can essentially prove with this commitment that we know the valid state root of Polygon. First, the event block. Okay, a bit of hands-on. So we want to prove that I own a lens profile on Polygon, whatever. So, number one, we go to the contracts. We see a contract, we go through it, and we see that Essentially, there is a bunch of logic on top of this ERC721. This is like the basic ERC721. As you can see, it's an abstract contract, and it's slightly modified. Instead of having like a standard mapping from like token ID to its owner, we have like token ID to token data. Token data is a struct. This struct is 32 bytes in total. 20 bytes is the actual owner, and the remaining 12 bytes represent when the token was minted. Okay, but how do I actually prove it? Oh, and also, very important thing when dealing with storage layout, we have something that is called like slot indices. So each variable has a uh, given slot, like in the um, some sort of meta layout, I call it like that, it's probably the right way. Anyways, this mapping is, has like the slot index two. I will get to this part in a second, why it's two. And we have a mapping from token ID. So you int to 32 bytes of data represented as a struct, but just think of it as some bytes. Okay. So uh, I guess most of you use Hardhat. So I'm going to present on, on Hardhat. There is a very, very cool tool to deal with storage layouts. It's called obviously Hardhat Storage Layout. This is how you install it. It's literally yarn install hardhat storage layout. You add one comment to your hardhat config. You write a new script that contains literally eight lines of code. You run the script and you get this weird table. And what does it, what does it really tell you? And oh, and by the way, why this tool is pretty useful? As you see, this contract is abstract. So some other contracts in can does it still work? Yeah, some contracts can inherit from it. And obviously why we inherit the storage layout, I mean, this, those this in synthesis can, can get more trickier because it also depends. Okay, so that's, it's pretty hard to coordinate like one hand with another hand, even though I'm Italian. Okay, anyways. Um, yeah, we know this slot in the in this index, and that's, that's how we get it. We have a column that is called storage slot, and as you see, underscore token data is marked as two, and that's it. Okay, but what do we do with it? How do we get this storage key? And yeah, that's that's it. Let me check the time. Okay, um, so a bit of hands-on. How do we get the actual storage? It sounds scary and it's meant to be scary. So we know the slot index, the storage index. I want to prove that it's like 0x, 35, na, 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 owns with ID 3594. How do we get the storage key? We essentially do this operation. So we concatenate the slot, I mean the key in the mapping which is 3594 because this is the token ID. As you know, we have a mapping from token ID to token data. Token data contains the own. Okay, so we concatenate this with the storage uh, index. We hash it all together. This is the storage key. 
that we have. Uh, if you're interested how to deal with it for like more complex mappings and like layouts, check the Solidity documentation, it's explained pretty well. So uh, now that's to make sure we got the proper storage key, let's just check it. How we can check it, super easy. Let's just make a one either PC call to get this storage at some specific key is the if get storage at. So the parameters. We want to access the storage of what? Of the lens hub. Lens hub is a contract that essentially is the representation of these profiles and its address is 0x, d, 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 4, and so on. And the slot. Oh, is it better? Oh, it's much better. And the slot. The, the storage key is 0x1, so essentially that's the hash that we got. And the result is 0x000, na, na, na. and we know that it's 32 bytes of data where we have 20 and 12. So let's split it into 12 and 20 bytes. And what we have is some number, like you can see 0x, a lot of zeros, then 62 till d. And this looks like a small number, so apparently it is a timestamp. And the second part is like 35, 57, and it's literally our address. So we got it correct. We have the proper storage key. Cool. But how do we actually get to storage proofs? So there are standardized methods in like the JSON RPC standard for Ethereum clients. And this method is called ETH get proof which essentially given the contract address, so um, better call it account address in this specific case, allows us to generate a state proof. And the uh, last argument, I mean, the sorry, the second argument is an array that contains all these storage, um, storage keys that we want to prove. Uh, there is another argument, which is 0x1a. It's essentially the block number for which we prove the state. Um, yeah, let's call this method. Oh, by the way, uh, you might have a question, how do we deal with this method on non-EVM chains? Uh, because for example, on some specific rollups, this method is like not supported. Actually, it's not a big deal because if you think of it, we just need the database. And on top of this database, we can literally build this, this method. We, we just need to know how the storage is constructed. Okay, this is the proof. It looks scary. It is scary. This entire object is four kilobytes of data. And now I mentioned before that the state is like a two level structure. First, we have a proof for the account itself. And then we have the proof for the storage. I mean, for the actual storage slot. It is scary. It's meant to be scary. One proof is like more or less 600 bytes. 700 bytes, it really depends, like bigger the storage is than bigger the proof is. And also more accounts we have than bigger the account proof is. So that's a lot of call data, if, um, if you, can you can imagine. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's pretty bad. Why? Because we need to post this proof on the chain. So it's a lot of call data, but okay, let's, let's try. What's gonna be the cost on like an EVM chain? That's the cost. It's like 600k of gas. That's a lot. That kills almost every single application that you want to build on top of this nice primitive. So it's pretty bad. And why is it that bad? So I explained on the high level what Merkle trees are and Merkle Patricia trees are. On Ethereum, we use Merkle Patricia trees. And essentially, there is a trade off that when using Merkle Patricia trees, the proof is a slightly bigger. It's like harder to decoded because actually we need to do some a bit of decoding there um, but we need to do less hashing so this is a trade-off but depending where we actually verify this proof it might be more feasible to verify uh, like a proof that is based on Merkle Patricia trees or Merkle trees okay but there is a solution and the solution is what if we snarkify such such a proof and we verify this proof inside the snark why is it cool because we can like, let's say that I'm gonna verify this proof inside the graph, graph 16 circuit. Um, and yeah, the verification costs more or less like 210K gas. The proof is like way less than 600 bytes. So it's good. So essentially get rid of the cold data because the proof itself can be the private input to the circuit. 
Um, yeah, we can like use uh, multiple proving system depending on the on the actual use case. And now, why is it like very very cool? So first of all, it removes call data. Second of all, it allows us to deal with very un unfriendly hashing functions or the EVM. These are the ones that we don't have precompiled for, like let's say Peterson. Um, so it might be like super expensive to verify such a proof on the EVM because first of all, it's a lot of call data and the hashing function is pretty like unfriendly. But what if we can like do it inside the snark and just verify a snark? And yeah, so another benefits, this really, really helps in abstracting the way how we verify these proofs because you don't need to have like one generalized verifier for each type of, of proof. But you can essentially abstract it behind behind the behind the snark, which is which is great. Uh, these numbers were taken from a very nice uh, article written by A16Z, like a bunch of uh, a few a few months ago. Um, yeah, and I think that's pretty much it. Let's get to the next slide. So, synchronous cross layer state access. So, how can actually a control deployed on some layer access the state of another L2 or L1? So I mentioned that we always need the state root, but because all of these systems have a native messaging system, we can send the small commitments like, for example, the block hash to like L1, usually it goes all through L1, and, and yeah, we can like unroll it or send the state root directly, and also we don't need to rely on messaging, but we can, for example, uh, rely on the fact that Polygon is like a commit chain and all these rollups like commit from time to time, they're like batches and, and so on. So this is like pretty important and we sort of can get the commitment from which we'll recreate the state directly on, on, on the one and then send it to another. Um, so if let's say Polygon commits on the one, I can send this commitment then to Starknet and Starknet to do the actual verification. Cool. So now how do we actually do that? So let's break the entire flow into like smallest pieces. So the flow is the following. We need to have access to the commitment, which is either a block hash or a state root. And again, we can get it or I, either by sending a message, relying on the fact that is this chain commit. So in a sense, it's still a message. We can relate in an optimistic manner, or we can go even more crazy and verify the entire consensus. Okay, so this is step number one. We need to get the commitment. Step number two, we need to somehow access the state root, so the commitments of the state from like a previous block or the actual block, because keep in mind that these commitments are only block hashes. And with block hashes, we can recreate headers, but we, we cannot access the state. Okay, so once we have the state root, we obviously need to verify this state slash storage proofs. Okay, and there are multiple approaches to do that. All of them come with some trade-offs and let's go through all these approaches. So approach number one, messaging. So I can send a message from, let's say, optimism to Ethereum L1. I can get the opcode, I, I can get the block hash by just calling the proper opcode and, and I get it. It takes some time, but still I get it. This is approach number one. So we rely on the built-in messaging system which is, I think, fair because the security of it is equal to the security of the rollup. And if you are deploying an application of this rollup, it's a fair assumption to do so. Um, yeah, it doesn't, oh, the, now about the downsides. So the message must be delivered. So it introduces a significant delay, especially when dealing with the withdrawal period in the, in, in the middle. Uh, and it requires we, it requires interacting with multiple layers. So first you need to send a message and then actually you need to consume it. So it's it's not ideal. But the trust assumptions are pretty okay. Another approach, consensus validation. By the way, this like Gremlin is supposed to verify a bunch of BLS signatures. I, I hope it's self-explanatory. Uh, okay, so maybe a few, uh, a bit of an intro. Um, right now we have POS as the native like consensus algorithm on Ethereum, which is pretty great because verifying the consensus is finally doable because before like verifying the hashing function ETH hash, which was used for proof of work was very memory intense. So not possible to do inside the snark. 
um, on chain directly. So it was almost impossible to do so. Um, so now we also have this fork choice rule called LMD goes, which is implementable, but doing all of this like directly is pretty expensive. So we need to ideally wrap inside the snark, but there is another downside. So a few words about the trust assumptions. You, well, you verify the consensus directly, so it's, it's fine. You, do you introduce any trust assumptions? Not really, but the biggest downside that generating the proof actually takes some time. So to be honest, this approach is feasible, but comparing to messaging, like quite often is like almost the same and you pay a lot of improving time and requires like having more advanced infrastructure. Okay, last approach that we actually uh, use is something that we call like an optimistic relayer based on MPC. MPC stands for multi-party computation. Maybe before I <laughs> explain how it works, let me explain the, the image. I hope it's self-explanatory. So it's an MPC protocol. We have multiple parties. These multiple parties attest something. Then we have an observer that can challenge it. And then we have finally the commitment given to a specific chain, in this case, Starknet, once everything is fine. How does it work? So we have a set of trusted relayers, validators, however, and they attest that a specific commitment is valid. So how does it work? If we want to get the commitment, aka the block hash of block number X on Starknet, then instead of sending a message that would be delayed with a like slightly delayed, we can essentially make an off-chain call, just get the latest one and essentially relay this message directly to Starknet. But it comes with a few downsides because while well, we introduce some trust assumptions, uh, but still it's okay. Okay, how does it work? So it works in a way that we have a bunch of off-chain actors who essentially make these calls and it works more or less like a multi seek but the reason why we have MPC is because more validators you have, then obviously more securities. But more validators you have in a like standard multi-sig approach, you have more signatures. So more in a way decentralized it is, then it's more expensive to verify because you need to verify multiple signatures and you need to like pass the signatures. It's a lot of call data. Such approach is not feasible on chains where call data is expensive. So L1, optimistic rollups, and yeah. Okay, so how does it work? Uh, what is the actually MPC part doing? The MPC part is very simple. It's essentially signing over like a specific curve, some specific payload, and the payload is the commitment itself. And that's it. Okay, so this is how we actually attest, but now how, why this op approach is called optimistic and why it's still secure. So first of all, we just posted some something on the actual L2, and as you may know, we can send messages from L1 to L2. And such a message can contain like the proper commitment. So essentially, even if the validator set will lie, L1 will never lie. So you can just challenge such a message. And now to participate in verifying this validators, it's super easy because it's literally two RPC calls. One call is gonna check the actual commitment on the actual chain, and the other one checks like what is the claimed commitment. If you disagree, you just send a message, it costs roughly 60K of gas, and that's it. Everyone can do that. Um, and again, the fraud proving window is pretty short because uh, it's essentially how long it will take to generate like the proof of consensus, if it's possible, or how long does it take to deliver the message. And what is pretty cool in this approach, it's not gas intensive, and we verify just one signature. So that's about this approach. Let's make a recap and let's identify the trade-offs. So we have three approaches. The first one is messaging. The second one is validating the consensus. And the third one is having this optimistic relayer. So I categorize it in four categories. The first one is latency. The second one is the gas cost. The third one is trust. And the last one is what is the off-chain computation overhead? Why do I even list it? Because if we do some sort of proving, then obviously it takes time because we need to generate the proof. So messaging. In terms of latency, we are quite sad because, well, the message needs to get delivered. So 
once the message gets delivered to some specific L2, L1 will be able to generate already new blocks. So we don't have like access to the newest values. In terms of gas cost, it's not bad, but it's not perfect because we need to interact with two chains at the same time. So first we need to send the message and consume it. In terms of trust, we are pretty happy because we trust the rollup itself and that's a fair assumption. Off-chain computation overhead, we're very happy because there is no computation to, to do off-chain. Verifying the consensus. So in terms of latency, we are sad because we need to generate the proof that we've done it. It takes a bit of time. In terms of gas cost, we are, I would say, sad because we need to verify the actual ZK proof, which is way more expensive than just consuming a message or verifying a signature. In terms of trust, we are happy because we verify the consensus itself. And computation overhead, it's significant, right? Because we need to generate the proof. Final approach, this optimistic relayer. So in terms of latency, we're happy because we simply make a claim and we post it on the other chain. That's it. Gas cost, we're very happy because the, well, we just verify a signature. In terms of trust, well, we are not that happy, but also not that sad at the same time because it still can be challenged in an optimistic manner using a fraud proof. Um, computation, off-chain computation overhead, we're pretty happy because we participate like an MPC protocol. So essentially the overhead comes mostly from communication, not computation itself. Cool, so this is part number one. These are the three approaches. Obviously, I'm not gonna say which one is the best because all of them come with some trade-offs. Um, okay, accessing the headers. I hope it's self-explanatory because we literally unroll something from the trusted input and the trusted input is again a block hash for a specific block X. And if you follow the initial slides, that's essentially each block, we, given a block hash, you can recreate the block header. And knowing the block header, we can access the parent hash. And by knowing the parent hash, you can recreate the previous block header. So essentially go till, till the Genesis block. So given this very small input, we can essentially unroll the state or whatever was present on the chain from this block till the Genesis block. Okay, so as I said, I'm gonna explain everything on, on the example of Ethereum. And today, all the block headers together are like roughly seven gigabytes of data. So it's quite a lot. But okay, this is how we actually do that. This is the high level concept and what are the approaches. So the first one, we call it like on-chain accumulation. So essentially we do this procedure, this computation directly on the chain. So we provide all these properly encoded block headers inside the call data and the block hash that we might receive as like the trusted input by sending a message, relaying it in an optimistic manner or validating the consensus. And yeah, like recursively go through all these headers and, and verify them. But there are many, many downsides because first of all, it's very call data intensive. It's very computational intensive. And now we can store all these headers on the actual chain, but you know, even storing on an L2 storing seven gigabytes of data is still a significant cost because the state on an L2 is reflected as call data on L1. So it's still expensive either way. But the cool thing is that I have direct access to, to like state rules or anything that I want to access. Next approach is on-chain compression. So we can still use the same approach as previously. So literally unroll it and process the seven gigabytes of data, but instead of like storing them, we can just update the Miracle tree. It's a nice approach, but comes again with a few downsides. It's very computationally intense because if we have like millions of headers, we need to perform millions of hashes on the chain. That's that's expensive, but at least we, we save on, on storing data. Um, and also we need to update the Miracle tree, which is, a, which is another cost. Um, last downside, is that we need to index all the headers that have been processed. Why we need to index them? Because if I want to up the, uh, access a specific block header, I need to provide the Merkle path because as we update the Merkle tree uh, and we just store the root in the contract itself, then I need to know the path, right? So I need to index the data and, and essentially once I, it's the moment that I want to access it, I need to provide the, the Merkle path. This approach is okay. It's I wouldn't say way better than the previous one, but it's 
way cheaper. Last approach. So there is a very cool primitive called Merkel Mountain Ranges. Love it. And the idea is let's do the same that we do previously inside the SNARK. So we can provide this tremendous amount of data as a private input to the circuit and essentially do the same computation like unrolling um, inside the circuit itself. And now we have a public input, which is the block hash. So essentially the commitment from which we unroll it. So the trusted input, the public input can be literally asserted when we do the on-chain verification. And while we unroll it, we can accumulate inside a Merkle tree or a Merkle mountain range. Why a Merkle mountain range is, is cool? Because well, well, let's imagine that you want to have like seven gigabytes of data processing once in a while. Like the proving time is going to be horrible. And why would you even like prove these commitments for like the entire history? Like, do you really need that? Probably not. So let's chunk it like into smaller pieces. And Merkle mountain ranges are a pretty cool primitive that allow to do this. To do, to do this, to give you like a, a bit of intuition, how how does it work? It's essential. Think of it as a tree of trees. Um, yeah. So once we do all this proving like off chain, we simply verify the proof on chain. As you know, like verifying the proof is is way cheaper than doing this directly on the chain. And still, we just provide a Merkle path, and that's it. We essentially have access to any sort of data we want. Let's do a recap again. So approach number one, on-chain accumulation, on-chain compression, off-chain compression. Three categories, prover overhead, gas cost, storage cost. Actually, gas cost should be computational cost. Okay, so prover overhead. On-chain accumulation, do we prove anything? Well, not really, so we are happy. On-chain compression, well, We still like need to update the Merkle tree. I think actually there is uh, there is an issue here, so I'll just skip this part. Off chain compression, we are very very sad because well we need to prove actually significant computation, so the proving time is significant. Okay, now in terms of gas cost, the third approach is horrible because it just costs a lot because we do the entire computation. On chain compression, well we are a bit happy because we just do a bit of computation, but still. It's a lot of cold data, a lot of computation, but lost, at least not so much storage. Storage cost, uh, oh, sorry, gas cost in the second approach while well, we just verify a proof, so it's cool. Um, okay, storage cost for the first approach, well, seven gigabytes of data. It is horrible, so we are very sad. On-chain compression, uh, sorry, storage cost for on-chain compression. We just store a, a root of the Merkle tree, so we are happy, and in the, Second case, we're even more happy because we, again, we just essentially keep updating a tree and we don't even need to post a lot, post a lot of call data because the call data we post is literally just the proof. So we're very, very happy. But again, I don't want to say that all of the, one of these approaches is the best one because as you see, there are trade-offs. And yeah, so this part is actually pretty easy. So as you know, as you may notice, here I was explaining like the second step when it comes to dealing with storage proofs. And now there is the, the last part, which is essentially verifying the proof itself. So approach number one is verifying the proof directly on the chain. Approach number two, let's verify the proof inside the snark and then verify the snark. Approach number three, let's ver verify multiple proofs inside the snark and then verify the snark. We can aggregate multiple snarks together and so on. But obviously there are some trade-offs, especially when it comes to proving time. Um, and yeah, so now, why the first approach is feasible on, on ZK rollups, for example, on StartNet call data is very cheap. And what we want to avoid in this specific proof is call data. So this approach is, for example, feasible on StartNet. But for example, if you want to verify like a proof on Optimism where call data is very expensive, you want to reduce it as much as possible. So for that reason, you, you might want to use a SNARK. And finally, if you have like many slots that you want to prove why can't you just verify them inside one snark you're gonna pay improver time but you just present one proof at the end so this approach is cheaper is the, most, the cheapest one but only if you have multiple actions to to take um, so there are trade-offs so let's identify them categories prover overhead latency verification cost so 
verify the proof directly, prove our overhead doesn't exist, latency doesn't exist because we don't need to prove anything. Verification cost, well, it is significant because we need to post call data and we need and we need to do the actual computation. So like going through the entire path and each step in the path is one hashing function. Oh, and also let me get back to the previous slide. I forgot this is very important. Why wrapping inside this wrapping inside this arc is pretty important. If you're like dealing with a storage layout that is using a specific hashing function, let's say for example Peterson. Peterson is not available like on, on, on the EVN. Like you just need to implement it. It's not the pre-compiled, it's, it's gonna be costly. But if you do it inside the snark and Peterson is pretty snark friendly, snark friendly, then well, you just verify snark on the one and you abstract it. So it's gonna be way, way, way cheaper. But again, there are trade-offs. Let me get back to this. So I went through the standard Merkle Patricia tree, snarkified proof, proof of overhead. It exists. So we are not super happy. Latency. We're also not happy because we actually need to spend time on, on proving this, this this thing. Verification cost, we are happy because, well, we, we just verify a proof, so it's fine. And snarkifying multiple proofs, the prover overhead is still there. Latency is still there, it's even bigger because it takes a bit longer in, in proving time. And verification cost, we are super happy because essentially we can mutualize the cost of verifying multiple proofs by just verifying one single snark proof. Okay, went through quite a lot of things. Let's put this all together. So let's imagine we have three chains and we want to have interoperability, interoperability between them. So we have chain Z, chain X and chain Y. So it all starts with a message, AKA commitment. We send a message in order to get the commitment. So let's say that we send a message from chain Z to chain X because on chain X we want to access the the state of chain Z. So what do we do? Once we have the commitment, we literally recreate all the headers using one of the three approaches. And once we recreate it, the header is still the point for which I want to prove the storage. I just verify a proof. And again, for verifying a proof, there are multiple approaches. But now let's say that on chain Y, I want to access the state of chain Z. And there is no direct communication between chain Y and chain Z. So it must be routed through chain X. By the way, I'm like talking about this in a pretty abstract way. By, by chain X, I just mean Ethereum later one. Um, yeah, so from chain X, I'm just gonna send again the commitment about chain Z as a message and then simply recreate all these all this headers. As you may not uh, notice, it's pretty redundant because we perform the same computation on two different chains. And we don't need to do that, especially if you use like the third approach, which is generating the proof on chain. Um, but now there is another problem. How do you actually know what you should do? Like you need to be somehow aware of what is happening. And for that reason, uh, we introduce a, an API. We don't expect like developers to deal with all that complexities, choosing the right approach for the direct thing. Essentially right now our APIs uh, optimizes cost wise. Uh, soon we'll be able to optimize latency wise. Um, and yeah, and essentially that's it. Um, that's about our API. I highly, highly encourage you to check this out. Um, and yeah, like a few final words about the API. It acts as a coordinator. It optimizes the costs. It optimizes the cost because we can batch multiple things. And once the job is done, you get a notification like via webhook, uh, via an event, like whatever you want. So essentially, we you're not, you don't need to be like an infrastructure maintainer and you can just focus on essentially building on top of this primitive. And I think that's it. Um, questions? So the API essentially is a REST API for now. We also have a JSON interface. We have off-chain on chain entry points, so we can request the data like by making an off-chain call, like calling a REST API or like calling a JSON RPC method. Um, or if your smart contracts like wants to access this data, then you just emit an event. We're gonna catch the event, and later on, like 
after a bit of time fit this uh, the specific data inside the smart contract. So we have like a bunch of interfaces. And by the way, speaking of like the off-chain entry points, once the entire like work is done on our side, you can get a notification. It can be like a webhook. We can like send you a bit of information like using a WebSocket. Uh, it can be essentially whatever whatever you want. Oh yeah, so uh, that's actually a great question. So different chains use a different like storage, uh, I would say architecture. They might commit to a Merkle Patricia tree, Merkle tree, uh, maybe even Verkle tree. And obviously, like I said, having a generalized uh, verifier is like pretty, it, it's not a clean approach. So we essentially abstract it by, by using a snark. And inside the snark itself, we just uh, do the proper work like you know, we go through the through the tree, like through the through the um, through the elements of the proof, and then we can like use a specific hashing function. So, for example, now Poseidon Poseidon is uh, is is pretty popular. Um, I think that Scroll uses Poseidon, and also zk sync uses Poseidon. On the EVM, like performing Poseidon will be pretty expensive. So, for that reason, you cannot verify the proof directly. But what you can do, you can do the entire verification inside the Snark, and then on the one, you don't really care what the Snark is like doing. You just just verify it. So that's how we actually deal it, deal with it. If we need to have it abstracted, we have it abstracted. If we don't, then we just don't. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that's uh, that's actually a good question because I think I went super technical. Uh, so actually, what we do at Herodotus every two weeks we have some internal hackathons, and right before the merge, uh, we build a proof of concept that we call the merge swap, and essentially we allowed anyone to dump their proof of work if on proof of stake and the way how it works we literally build a bridge on top of this technology and the bridge works in a way that you can lock your if proof of work inside a smart contract on if proof of, on the if proof of work chain you can prove that you've done it on ethereum proof of stake you can once you the proof is verified you can meet the erc20 token and you can do whatever you want with this token. And then if you want to withdraw back to if you're in proof of work, you just burn it, you prove the fact that you burned on the other side, and, and yeah, that's it. Also, in terms of uh, other use cases, I think that cross-chain collateralization is pretty cool because this is the place where you want to avoid latency as much as possible and you want to be asynchronous as much as possible. And essentially, that's that's what we do here because our latency comes only from from the proving time but again using some optimistic approaches and so on there are a lot of things we can do here i hope it uh, answers the question okay i think that's it i have like three minutes so i guess we can wrap it up and yeah thanks